Hi guys, James at Rampant Live Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Sweden and we're going to return to a brewery that has featured on the channel many a time before. This will be review number 40 or 45 that I've done from this brewery. They're one of my favourite Swedish breweries actually. They're not afraid to try different styles, but the beer we're going to have a look at today is one that we've had quite a few of here on the channel over the last little while. It's the latest instalment from one of their really kind of popular series that they've got. So for this review, then we will head up towards Gothenburg once again, Jutebor as you would say in Swedish, the Swedish craft beer capital up there on the west coast. Got to get that Gothenburg catchphrase in when we're reviewing Gothenburg beers because it is just a channel tradition these days. And for this one we will head out to the east of the city a little bit to Landvetter, very close to the airport. And that means that we're going to have a look at yet another beer from the wonderful Dugis Bregory. So this particular beer is the latest member of the Crush series, which is their series of New England hazy, whatever you want to call it, double IPAs. It's called the C1000. It comes in at 8% ABV as always and apparently this one is quite Amarillo centric but it's got a base of mosaic and citra so it should be quite an orangey leaning one and as you know if you've watched the channel for any length of time I do love an orangey leaning IPA but uh, yeah this beer was released as part of the local Smoskalig assortment through Sistembolaget here in Sweden for February of 2021 and this is the second of four Dugas reviews that you'll see over the course of February 2021. The first one was the pills, now we've got this one. I have uh, a sour beer to have a look at and also a Hopfenweisen as well, which I'm quite curious about. But um, yeah, really curious to see how this one turns out. Hopefully it's another good beer, but I have been really enjoying the IPAs from uh, Dugas recently. So I'm hoping that this one is as good as the last crush beer that we had. So uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy my take on it as well. So let's kick off with this review then. So as always with my reviews, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Dugas Brewery before. And like I said, you will see more added to that list in the near future. There's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, reviews do please consider subscribing to the channel the whole channel of course has a geography based tagging system so you can go into the home page and search for beer based on country city state county province prefetch or whatever it is you're interested in do check out the playlist of beers from different countries there is one there for all the swedish beers that i've reviewed for you that's constantly being added to and as always please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review it's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely hugely appreciated. So anyway, to tell you a little bit about Dugas Brewery once again then, on to my brewery notes. So as I've mentioned to you already, Dugas Brewery are based in Landvetter, just out to the east of Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast, and the brewery was founded back in 2005 in Mölndal, to the south of the city, by Mikael Engström Duga, whom of course it takes its name from. But a few years prior to this, Mikael had met an Englishman who was selling second-hand breweries, and this really got him thinking about brewing his own beer. So he studied the admittedly very complex Swedish alcohol laws of the time. They still are complex to these days, but I think, you know, they've liberalised them quite a little bit for the craft breweries. Um, but when he did this, he also visited other breweries around the country and he started buying up equipment to put together his own brewery. And this culminated with the opening of their first facility in Mölndal back in 2005. Um, over the following years, they continued to grow this facility, but by 2009, they'd outgrown this original brewery. And so they moved over to Landvetter the following year in 2010. Uh, the older brewery had a capacity at peak of 1,500 hectolitres of beer per year, but the new brewery started off with a capacity of 8,000 hectolitres per year, and this has been more than doubled in recent years. I actually don't know what capacity these guys are brewing each year. Um, but over the years, the brewery have become very well known for lots of different styles. Initially, they were brewing a lot of kind of sour beers and uh, fruit beers and, you know, uh, big imperial stouts and porters and stuff like this as well. I believe that Dugas were actually known originally as the Dugas Ull of Porterbrewery uh, for quite a wee while but probably two of the classic beers from these guys would be the Tropic Thunder which uh, I think was one of the first um, one of the first big produced sour beers here in Sweden and then also the Egypt but I believe you have to get the big Egypt now actually that was the big imperial stout so those are probably two of the classic Dugas beers that you really need to have a go at more recently though they've been focusing a little bit more on uh, 
on IPAs and they've got various different series of IPAs these days. They've got the fresh series, which is, you know, the kind of lower alcohol New England IPAs. Then they've got the crush series, which is this one, the New England double IPAs around 8%. And then they've also got the bite series of West Coast IPAs. They've been investing a lot in their barrel aging program as well. That's the future series that they do. And uh, yeah, you know, they've done various other different beers over the years as well. Probably my favourite beers that I've had from Dugas actually would be the Imperial Coffee Stouts that they did, notably Key and Sidamo Dimtu, which were done in collaboration with Hunter and Sons, a little coffee roastery in Bristol or Bath, I forget, um, over in the southwest of England. But they went bust, unfortunately. But Dugas Brewery, in my mind, are one of the best coffee stout producers around. And uh, I would always recommend you try a coffee stout from these guys if you get the chance. They really know what they're doing on the dark end of the spectrum. But like I say, They've done lots of different styles and they, uh, they are not scared to experiment a little bit, which is great. Uh, but another thing to note about these guys is that they are also one of the co-owners of the Brewers Beer Bars uh, in, in Gothenburg. The original one is Tredi Longatan and you can check out my out and about video that I did there if you're interested. They co-own this bar along with uh, All In Brewing and I think Electric Nurse as well, which is run by Mikael's daughter Ida along with her husband John. Both of those breweries, of course, have some very nice beers as well and I would recommend that you check them out. But if you go and visit the uh, the Brewers Beer Bars, then you'll get quite a few Dugas IPAs and stuff that won't make it through uh, Sistempolaga. But it was actually only within the last two years or something like that that Dugas started to release IPAs quite heavily through Sistempolaga. Before that, yeah, you could only get them in the Gothenburg area on tap. So it's been quite a transition from Dugas Brewery over the last little while. But um, yeah, that's all I can really tell you about Dugas Brewery for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can, of course, check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn more about all those different beers that they've done. So um, yeah, let's get on and actually have a taste of this beer itself then. Really curious to see how it turns out. So, yeah, there's a little look at the artwork quickly before we open up. C1000, as you can see, it's, you know, quite typical uh, Dugas art with this one. It's always got a nice kind of pattern behind it there. Um, but you can see they've got the hops listed on this little sticker here. Plain kind of gold bottle cap. Uh, usually it's a gold or a black bottle cap from Dugas. I do wish they would do black ones just with, with Dugas written on it. I think that would be a really nice touch for the beers. I say that pretty much every Dugas review that I do. Um, but, yeah, this one contains wheat and oats which is what you'd expect from a New England IPA. But it says on the side here, this is C1000, C1000. Yes, C1000. C stands for crush, as this is a crush series double IPA. 1000 that we, means that we, brew, that we initially brewed this beer as a small batch beer of 1000 litres. However, we liked it so much that we re-brewed it. So this is C1000, an experiment in Amarillo hops on a base of mosaic and citra. Uh, so lush, yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, as we know, uh, Amarillo uh, and Citra are two of the original high alpha acid hops from the States. Amarillo, I think, sits at around 12% alpha acid. Lovely big kind of oily orangey colours, uh, flavours from it, not colours. Um, whereas Citra is around 13 to 14% alpha acid. Uh, that tends to give you some nice kind of mangoey notes and some other little tropical fruit for complexities. And Mosaic, we know, is a slightly uh, more kind of bright, juicy tangerine note that you get from that. Also 13 to 14% alpha acid though. All three hops American, uh, but yeah, I think this one should be quite nice. So um, yeah, 330 milliliter bottle this one. I think I paid like 35 Swedish kroners for this one. If I remember rightly, it might have been 40. Let's assume it's 40 because that's more expensive. So four euros, probably about three pounds, you know, 30, three pounds 30, something like that sterling. And then in American dollars, probably about four dollars $4. 50, something like that. But um, yeah, let's get this guy out and we'll get on with the taste. And then very curious to see what this beer has in store for us. I always enjoy trying some new things from Dugas Brewery. And as I said uh, earlier on in the video, I love kind of orangey leaning New England IPAs. So curious to see what this one has in store for us. Shugle up the last little bit. And there we go. Um, so yeah, certainly looks very, very nice. So uh, yeah, as you can see with this one, and as you'd kind of expect from a New England IPA, it looks like a really nice kind of fruit juice color. I would describe this one as being a very bright kind of yellow uh, mango juice color, to be honest with you. So the head on this beer, 
Um, it's poured with just under a finger of a frothy, I would say perfect white head. That's going to fade away, I think, quite quickly, though, to just be a very, very thin foamy layer. You can al already see the volume of that head just going down. But there's one or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass, a few little ones going up towards the bottom of the head there. But overall, it does look pretty nice and nothing overly surprising about this beer in terms of its appearance when you consider what style it is but um yeah as i said this one for me the color of this beer is quite bright and yellow so i would describe it as a sort of mango juice color i always like comparing these new england hazy ipas to um i always like comparing them to different fruit juices of course um but yeah i remember the color of your beer is dependent on two things one the type of malts that you use two the length of your wort boil the longer you boil the wort the more the sugars caramelize and thus you get a darker color out of it but in the first instance it is dependent on the types of malt that you use but um yeah the haziness level on this one is it's, it is all right to be honest with you and um, it's not the soupiest and gloopiest of new england ipas that you're going to come across the level of haze in these beers of course is you know, attributed to the oats and the wheat uh, rate of those kind of ratios in the beer the yeast can also contribute to that as well um, and it varies from brewery to brewery to be honest with you theoretically though the higher you go up the alcohol scale you've got more oats and wheat in the beer so it should get hazier but that's not always the case to be honest with you but um, yeah it certainly looks the part for a New England double IPA this one so yeah let's get on and have a look at the aroma then nothing too much more to say about the uh, appearance of this one and nothing particularly surprising about it so um yeah let's go for it then that does smell pretty nice actually um on the malty side of things this beer smells very very smooth and actually very well balanced in its malt base so I've, as i've repeated in a few reviews recently there's six different directions you can take a new england ipa i think um so it can be more kind of yeasty and farmhousey it can be a little bit more kind of grainy and rye leaning it can be oaty and creamy wheaty and bitey you know soft and white bready and it can also be kind of brown sugary leaning and quite sweet uh, and quite often these beers exhibit a few characteristics of a couple of those directions so for me this one seems as if it's quite balanced and you know it comes across as a little bit almost old school in its uh, in its malt base a lot of the new england ipas i've encountered recently have been leaning towards the sweet side of things this one strikes me as being a little bit more akin to you know the old school um ones here in sweden the the new sweden ipa the narangi the uh, the amazing haze and stuff this one has this really kind of smooth and sort of bready leaning malt base so you definitely do get a nice little bit of a smooth white bready character out of this one you've got a little bit of a wheaty bitiness in there and you do have some nice kind of smooth oaty notes i think the wheat actually is probably the least prominent of those three components that i've come across um or that out of this one but yeah if you take the aroma in a bit more deeply you do get some nice um you do get some nice um sort of wheaty to say you do get some nice wheaty bitiness out of it when you take the aroma in a bit more deeply but i think if you're just kind of passively smelling it it comes across as as more oaty you do get a nice kind of oaty smoothness out of it and it's got a wee bit of thickness and, and almost sweetness from the oats as well some nice kind of soft white bready characters in there um but yeah the malt base on this beer is quite nice there's no real kind of sweet element to the malt base for me it does just come across as quite smooth and that's my basis for saying that um it strikes me as being a bit more old school because i think the sweetness that's coming in new england ipas these days is a bit more of a kind of newer phenomenon to be honest with you but yeah the aroma of that beer on the malty side of things is quite nice uh, but it's the hops of course that we should be focusing on when uh, when we talk about new england ipas so uh yeah for me uh this one does have a wee touch of earthiness to it i think that's the mosaic that's going to give you that you've got a nice big kind of floral aromaticity to this one all three of the hops in here are high alpha acid hops so that's kind of to be expected i wouldn't describe this beer as being spicy but the floral aromaticity does have a big presence in the beer uh, and there is a bit of grassiness um there is a bit of grassiness there as well and the grassiness does have a wee touch of zest to it for me um, but yeah, I do like how this one um, goes together in that sense too. So um, yeah, take a little bit of time and just focus on that green component of the beer. But the fruity side of the beer actually has a, a fair bit of power behind it, to be honest with you. There's a fair kind of citrusy kick to this beer. And to me, that's a little bit surprising, to be honest with you. I suspect that what they've done here is that the citron and the mosaic will have been used as the bittering hops, and they probably will have been used a little bit in the um, 
you know, in the, the the latter, the later edition things as well. Remember, the bitterness of your beer is dependent on how much hops you put in the early stages during the wort boil. Um, you get a trade off over the course of the wort boil in terms of um, you know you, you get a, a trade off basically. Um, if you add the hops early on during the wort boil, they'll give you a little bit more. Um, you know they'll give you more bitterness, whereas if you add them later and later, you get more flavour and aroma. So I think mosaic and citra are being used early on in the hot boil here. Then the amarillo is being added later on as the kind of aroma and flavour hop, if you like. Um, but on the fruity side of things, you do actually get a fair. I think there's a fair chunk of passion fruit out of this one, and I think that's the citra that's going to give you that. Um, citra is one of the most diverse hops in terms of all the different fruits and things you can get out of it. But I definitely get a fairly strong tropical note out of this one for sure and it's it's as i say a stronger passion fruit you do get a wee bit of mango there once your nose adjusts to that um to that kind of initial strength of it too but then once your nose is adjusted that's when you start to get the big orangey characters out of this one so you can smell a bit of the lighter sort of juicier tangerine from the the mosaic i would say but then um it, the fruity side of the beer starts to be dominated by the um it really starts to be dominated by the um, kind of more oily Amarillo the beer as well. Um, I, I always used to love Amarillo hops. It's nice to see them getting a little bit more attention in recent times because, you know, they disappeared for quite a long time when Amarillo came onto the scene. Um, but you had the same, you know, when Galaxy came along, you had the same with Simcoe. Simcoe disappeared in favour of Galaxy for quite a while as well. Um, but we're now starting to see the hops. There's a bit more diversity in hops these days, actually, which is great. And there's always new hops coming out, you know, Sabro, Talus, um, Enigma. You've got all of these different hops kind of coming out now as well, which is which is great. Um, but yeah, the aroma of this beer is quite nice. The more you smell of it, the more orangey and kind of citrusy and zesty it starts to become. So take a little bit of time to enjoy the aroma of this beer before you get stuck into it. But we're going to taste it now. And see how we go. So this one is the C1000, a New England hazy double IPA coming in at 8% ABV, part of the Crush series from Dugas Brewery in Landvetter uh, near Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast. Let's get stuck in. Slange, Skoll, cheers. Yeah. That's pretty nicely done, I have to say. Um, but I'm not surprised, you know, I've had some really good beers, some really good IPAs, I should say as well, from um, from Diggis Brewery in recent times. Um, I'll tell you something as well. This one strikes me. It's, the Dugas IPAs have always had a little bit of a lighter mouthfeel than other ones, but I think um, in recent times, they've kind of they, they'd sort of just balanced that out a little bit better for me. This beer takes a bit of a different step, I think, from the other ones I remember having in recent times. This one comes across as being a little bit more. Um, it's almost got a little bit more kind of slickness to it, a little bit more kind of oiliness, if that makes sense. So that's definitely an interesting move. From um, from Dugas in that sense, the, the mouthfeel of this beer is different from the other IPAs I've had in recent times from them. But nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with trying something a wee bit different. So kudos to them for uh, for doing that actually. Um, yeah, but I will say I like this beer. I do like this beer. Um, it's got a really nice. Um, it's just got a really nice kind of. Um, how would you say? Um, slightness, as I say, it's got a nice kind of the first impression I get of this one is it's got a nice oily but quite zesty character to it, and then it's just got a nice slickness overall. But yeah, let's try and break down the flavour of it a little bit more. Then, those are my initial impressions of this beer. But yeah, um, on the um. On the 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 malty side of things, then um, it does actually have a little bit more of a kind of wheat presence to it than the aroma uh, would have you believe. But at the same time, um, it, it is quite balanced. Again, it is quite balanced, and that that thing I was saying earlier about it being a little bit old school in terms of its malt base, I would say that that holds true. To be honest with you, so across that middle third of your palate, you do get a nice little bit of a kind of softer. 
um, bready character coming out of the beer, which I think is um, is quite nice. You can feel that sort of barley malt sort of softness coming out of this one. So I think that might be a little bit of, there might be a wee touch of like, you know, golden promise or something like that in here, which is, uh, which again is quite nice. And um, so you can feel that soft, but still quite crisp white bready character, just blankets in the middle of your tongue. But you'll feel that in the center of the palate, you get a nice little bit of a kind of OT um, smoothness just kind of sitting on top of it there. The middle third of your palate, it doesn't, the malty part of the beer doesn't feel all that thick, but yeah, you get a wee bit of the smoothness and slight sweetness out of the oats as well and it does it does almost give you just a very slight dry and slightly powdery note out of this um out of it as well so yeah the oaty character i think starts to come out a little bit more in the aftertaste but you can taste a wee bit of the booziness um, in this beer as well the oats uh, uh, the oats and the barley malt are the things that are covering the booziness in the beer actually um so yeah that's that's definitely worth pointing out about this beer but then yeah as you go further back as you go to that border region between middle third and back third of your palate you do get a wee bit of sort of grainy note in that border region but then the back third of your palate is all about the wheat the wheat's got a nice kind of bitiness to it there and you can feel that back third of your palate is distinctly kind of thicker if you like there's definitely more of a kind of bitey wheaty bready character that coming out of the beer there so yeah Um, yeah, the the sort of um, yeah, this beer I would say it really does lean a good bit more to the wheaty end of the spectrum than um, than it would have you believe. But it's quite separated, as I say. The back third of your palate has a good bit of wheaty bitterness to it. The middle third of your palate has the the kind of quite crisp, quite bready note underneath it. And then you've got the smoother oats there as well. But I think in terms of the power of the flavour, just yeah, the sheer power of the flavour, I think the wheat starts to kind of dominate that middle of your palate there. So it's, it's quite interesting this one, but I think having a slightly bitier wheaty side to the beer helps bring out the sort of citrusy um, side of this one a little bit more as well. I think that helps promote it. But yeah, I think there's not much else we can kind of say about the malt base in this one. So let's focus on the hoppy part of the beer. So for the green component then, in the back corners of the palate, there's definitely a wee touch of earthiness to the beer. That would be the mosaic, I think, that will be giving you that. But as you move further forward, it does develop a wee tiny bit of herbalness, but then it really builds more of a kind of big floral aromatic quality as you go kind of further forward along the... the um, along the side of the tongue. So I do like how that um, how that comes out of the beer as well. It does develop a nice kind of big green component actually. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that the, the, it does have a wee touch of spiciness to it, but I'd say it's more just like a big aromatic green component that you get on the kind of front sides of your tongue but around the front curve of the palate you do get a little bit more of a kind of grassiness to the beer but at the same time it has you know it does have a nice kind of zestiness to it in a sense as well so i like how, i do like how all of that sort of pieces together actually so yeah this one it, it gets a thumbs up from me for sure i think this is this is a solid um it's another solid beer from Dugas, but this is kind of what we've come to, to expect from them, actually. Um, but yeah, the fruity side of the beer then, let's focus on that. So as I always say, on the front third of your tongue, that's where you get that nice oily bubble where those juicy fruity esters just um, just roll their way out of the beer. So if you go to that border region between front third and middle third of your palate, there's a wee bit of a kind of, um, again, sort of a bread crusty type quality comes out of it, which, which, uh, which I quite like. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a wee bit of a kind of bitey graininess there. But underneath the, the front third of your palate, it actually feels that there's a little bit more of the kind of bitey, wheaty quality coming out of it. And it's almost like the more that you drink of this beer, it's like on the middle line of your tongue, if you like, you can feel some of the wheaty bitiness just kind of coming along this beer. So this this one, it, it, in terms of the IPAs, it really leans towards that wheaty, bitey and kind of big citrusy, zesty side of things. But yeah. On the front third of your palate then, if you go towards the back of it, you can get a bit of a kind of more powerful passion fruity note out of the beer, which um, which I do quite like. So that passion fruity note kind of sits there. As you move further forward, it's got a wee bit of a kind of mangoey character as well at the same time, which I, again, I can quite appreciate. Um, but yeah, you've got, um, how would you say, 
you've got a wee bit more um there are a few kind of other tropical fruits in there you will pick up a wee bit of a you know papaya apricot those things you always get these complexities from citra but um yeah you can feel as you move on to that front half of the front third of your tongue the oiliness the sheer oiliness of the amarillo really starts to dominate there and the amarillo actually has a real it has a really big zestiness to it in this beer and i guess that's maybe something that is it's interesting to see amarillo in the new england's because until recently it's not something that's been that common to be honest with you i would have had amarillo more in the west coast ipas and um I think that the sweetness of the malt bases in the West Coasters would have, they wouldn't quite, it would mean that the hoppy side of the beer wasn't quite as zesty, if you like. It would be a little bit more kind of oily, if that makes sense. So I think the New England really shows off the, a little bit more of the zesty side that Amarillo can have. But, pardon me, as you progress further into the aftertaste, you can feel the slightly lighter tangerine notes of the the mosaic pushing their way out in this one. So I do like how um, how that goes together in this beer as well, for sure. So yeah, the the fruity side of this beer, I think, um, does uh, the fruity side of the beer does piece together quite nicely. But I think the zestiness almost dies away a little bit the further you go into the aftertaste, and it's the more oily amarillo that just kind of sits there, if you like. And when they're saying the beer is amarillo centric, um, that's kind of to be expected. But yeah, I think the. Uh, the citra offers a nice little bit of contrast there, a wee bit of passion fruit, a wee bit of mango and stuff. And I think the mosaic's just adding a wee bit more kind of uh, complexity, if you like, to the to the oranges, actually. Um, and that, I think, was the main reason that mosaic kind of almost replaced Amarillo in a lot of ways, because it just has a wee bit more complexity than Amarillo. Amarillo is a very straight shooting, oily orange, from what I remember. Um, but yeah, the, this beer, I think, is really nice. It's a really, as I say quite a wheaty leaning New England IPA the more you drink of it and it's quite zesty in a lot of ways as well um, so I like it I have enjoyed this one actually and, and the mouthfeel is quite different from the other Dugas so I think on that note we can leave the the flavour profile and focus on the mouthfeel so like I said I find this beer is a little bit lighter than some of the other uh, Dugas ones I've had recently uh, the mouthfeel overall I would describe as being quite smooth but you know this beer really has a big zesty vibe to it as I've said the carbonation is very smooth and um, there's a wee touch of oily quality to this beer as well actually in terms of hoppy bitterness and things what would we say about this one I think this is a fairly kind of standard low IBU beer you know 25 or 30 um, IBU, so yeah, a little bit of that coming out of the beer, um, but um, yeah, that does go together. Um, it does go together really nicely in that sense too. So yeah, about twenty five or thirty IBUs. Um, the malt base, like I say, it has a wee bit of Christmas to it from the barley malt, but it's got a bit of it's got quite a bit of bite from the the wheat, and then on the fruit side of things, you've got a wee bit of oily character to it. But this one really leans towards the zesty part of the spectrum but overall another solid solid New England double from Dugas I was glad I was able to review this one for you this is one of the reasons I always keep an eye on what this brewery are releasing but um, yeah I think on that note we can leave the review there so yeah I hope you guys have enjoyed this one once again thank you for watching my beer reviews until the next time please like subscribe share all the usual YouTube stuff let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below let me know what your favorite beers are from Dugas Brewery make sure you check these guys out try a few different styles from them pick a style you like and you're you know pretty much guaranteed a a good beer from Dugas. I've not really had any disappointing beers from them that I can think about. One of the best breweries and most consistent breweries, I think, in uh, in Sweden these days. So, uh, yeah, thank you again for watching. As I say, check out my social media, check out Dugas Brewery. This beer was the C1000, part of the Crush Double IPA series from Dugas Brewery in Landvetter, very close to uh, Gothenburg on the Swedish West Coast. Slange, skull, cheers, and catch you guys in the next review.